Well, good morning. This morning, welcome to Colonial Church. My name is Aaron Roberts, and it is actually a Sunday, which we have needed one of these for a while. As we come in into in each one of our pews, we have pew pads. So please take that, place your name in that, and pass that down to whoever may be sitting next to you. And if there is a prayer that you would like to share with our church community, we have prayer cards in the, in the pews too. Take one of those, fill it out, and then place it in the offering plate later in the service. A few announcements to draw your attention to. During this season of Lent, we're making a few changes within our worship life as Colonial. We are using adapted words for the doxology, so you will see those on the screen when we reach that point of the service. And we also begin our time of worship in a more meditative tone, a slower hymn, but we will build towards joy as the service proceeds. Lots going on in the life of the church this evening. One of our movie nights is being held at 5 o'clock. The movie is called Bad Baghdad Cafe and is a story of transformation. So everyone is invited to come and enjoy that. And then next Saturday night, our, one of our larger fellowship events, Trivia Night, will be happening. And I have a bonus question for anyone who's here this morning who will be playing trivia next Saturday night. Now, if you are not yet on a trivia team, there is time. We will get you signed up for a team. Do you want to tease your question? Okay, all right. Who was the first United States president to make a radio broadcast? Who do you think it was? Not Roosevelt. Coolidge. It was Calvin Coolidge. Yes. So you now have one answer for trivia night. We hope you will come next Saturday night. The season of, of Lent traditionally involves fasting. Jesus fasted. He would go periods of time without eating. Now, as a rule, how many, well, I'm curious, how many of you fast sometimes? Do, you, do any of you? Okay, sometimes, all right. We, as a rule, people don't fast much today, but it is still a good Christian practice. In a time of oversaturation, overeating, overworking, fasting may be exactly what our souls need. Because until you are truly hungry, you don't necessarily know what you want or what you need. We have every kind of food imaginable within just a short drive of where you're sitting right now. And yet, sometimes we have trouble naming what we're actually hungry for. During the season of Lent that leads up to Easter, we, um, we as a congregation are doing a, gospel, a trip through the Gospel of John. And it is one of those Gospels that it delves deeply into the idea of eternal life. Now, okay, this is going to date me a little bit, but how many of you watched or know of the, sh uh, the show back on the 70s and 80s, the show MASH? Okay. In the show of MASH, there was a really powerful episode where Major Winchester, who was one of the surgeons on the show, he was the proper Bostonian. He was not always right, but he was never in doubt. <laughs> he was intelligent, but arrogant. He was an excellent surgeon, but in the reality of war, with all of the death that he was exposed to, and he became very aware of his own mortality and everything that he was seeing going on around him. And he began to wonder, was there more than just this life? What was behind the curtain of death? And as he was about to lose one more patient, he sat behind the dying young man and held his hand.
as he was dying, he experienced the smell of bread. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. My prayer is that on this morning in Lent, that you have the chance to wonder. To wonder about eternal life about what your soul hungers for, what you yearn to see and to smell. In that hope, this morning, let's lean in with wonder. Let's worship. There is a spirit there's an energy inside each one of us. And that energy is eternal. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot go away. As we come into this time of worship, I invite you to feel the spirit of life that flows through your body. Take a moment to acknowledge the life that is in you, the energy. As spiritual beings, let's now honor the God that we are here to worship. It is with great awe and wonder that Christians throughout the centuries have thought about this life and the next life and what message Jesus has brought to us. Our opening hymn this morning asks the question that we sit with during this Lenten season. Would you stand as you are able and join me in singing, What Wondrous Love Is This? Number 223 in our hymnal and words on the screen.
Please be seated. In these days of information overload, we need to look and listen deeply for the call of the Spirit in our midst. Confident in God's love for us, will you join me as we confess our sins in faith? Enlightening Spirit, when we get discouraged in seeking your truth in the midst of bewilderment. Have mercy and cure us. Challenging Spirit, when witnessing to your truth seems to take more courage than we have. Surprising Spirit, when we settle for half-truths in building your beloved community. We continue our prayer with a moment of silent reflection. We know the love of God knows no bounds. The Holy One who sent Jesus, the only begotten, to be our way, our truth, and our light. Let us feel ourselves forgiven and go forth with courage renewed. Please rise in body or in spirit. joy we find in an act of forgiveness and what power we find to have our courage renewed, not just as individuals, but as a community. Would you take a moment now and greet all those who are gathered here? Well, hello. My name is Bob, and I'm going to be out of town for about two and a half weeks, and I'm going to miss Easter, and I'm going to miss Palm Sunday. And I was thinking the other day, I'm kind of sad about that. So I decided I would have a little Easter celebration with you all this morning. But first, before we celebrate, does anyone remember why we celebrate Easter? Hmm? Yeah, right. Jesus was dead, but on Easter morning, God gave him a new life and sent him down to see the disciples, and they had new hope and new joy. So Easter is all about new and 
your lives are new too. That's why adults like to celebrate Easter with the kids, because it's all new. And one of the ways I like to celebrate Easter is with Easter eggs. And especially with Easter eggs that have something inside them. But these Easter eggs are different. These are baby animal Easter eggs, and you're going to get to get your pick. And we have like a baby cow egg, and a baby pig egg, and a baby elephant egg, and a baby frog egg, and that's the baby pig egg. And then this baby, I don't know what he's a baby of. Can you see him? Mate? A, you're right. That's a baby hippo egg. Way to go. Okay, well now I know. Okay. So let's, we're, hmm? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the baby monkey. Yeah. He's nice, too. We each get to take a baby. We do, and they got something in there. So let's have a little prayer here, and then everybody can choose the one you like, okay? Let's bow our heads, um, and you can repeat after me. Dear Lord. Thank you for giving Jesus new life and sending him to live with us in our hearts. Amen. Okay, let's see here. Which one does everybody want? You want the cow? Okay.
I couldn't quite find a picture of it. But as an undergraduate, uh, a freshman at the University of Minnesota, several days a week, I would walk by graffiti on the Washington Avenue Bridge that said, Jesus saves sinners and redeems them for valuable cash prizes. <laughs> and I, it was irreverent, but for whatever reason, it tickled my funny bone all the time. And the reason I even remember it is that right about that time during my freshman year, um, Pastor Stephanie, who is the pastor at the church that I was attending, gave a sermon that got me thinking. She taught that if we proclaim Jesus saves, then you have to know from what. To be saved, you have to know from what you're being saved. I had never thought about it like that before. And so it got me thinking about my own faith. What am I being saved from? So I grew up in the United Church of Christ. And one of my favorite lines from the statement of faith is, God seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. And I've always liked that. That my faith causes me to live in a way, to live differently, that saves me from aimlessness and sin. Gives me purpose and passion in, these, in this life. The path of discipleship makes my life fuller with the hope of healing no matter what I face. Now, what I didn't know back then was that I had a very synoptic perspective. Now that word synoptic, it means Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three Gospels. They all have a very similar view, sin, same, optics, view. They have a very similar way of looking at things. But during Lent, we are looking particularly at the perspective of the other Gospel, the Gospel of John, the one that I'm calling the uneasy Gospel. And so it was during that freshman year that there was a Christian group on campus that was trying to recruit me. And their recruiter was a really nice guy, very enthusiastic. And he knew that I worshipped at a little church near campus. And in the course of getting to know me, he asked, are you saved? And I remember, I was like, there was that saved thing again. I knew the answer to this one now. So I answered, yes, and I should have stopped there, <laughs> but I didn't. I'd had all these insights, and I told him about the sermon that I had heard a few weeks before and how I was been thinking about what I was saved from, and I told him about that. What I found out that was from his perspective, perspective I was clearly not saved. Here's a well-known passage that Shay referred to a few weeks ago. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. Here is another from John's Gospel. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever doesn't believe in the Son won't see life, but the angry judgment of God remains on them. From a Johannine perspective, from John's perspective, being saved is all about eternal life. You are saved, and it isn't a question, you are saved from death. Now, my enthusiastic friend had a very, to use the theology word, Johannine soteriology. He was very John about what he believed about being saved. And he was pretty sure that my eternal soul was in danger. That I was confused about the nature of true salvation. In terms of being saved, he was in I was not. It was close, but wasn't quite there yet. And I left that conversation feeling kind of irritated and judged, and I definitely did not want to go to his Bible study. 
Now, last week, we considered the perspective, and the, rather, the context in which John was, wrote his gospel, because it is quite different from the others. Now, it was written many decades after the first one that we have in the Bible, which is Mark, and the world changed a lot during those decades. Whereas, in Mark's time, Christians and Jews, they worshiped together in the same place. They had the same holidays, same traditions. And John saw his community coming apart. Jews and Christians were beginning to go their separate ways. For a few generations, Christians had lived and worshipped with Jews, but after the destruction of Jerusalem, things had changed. Communities were divided. People who were deciding who was with them and who was not. And John felt the pain of rejection. He felt the pain of this division. And he was hurt. And it was important to him to be able to say who's in and who's out. He drew the line along Shared belief. So the days of Mark are gone. Those early days are gone. And where Mark was writing, and it was this invitation to people to ask about Jesus. Who do you say that this man was? By John's day, the expectation is that every person has to make a statement of belief that Jesus is God. And that by that belief be granted the gift of eternal life. Being saved from death to eternal life was the ultimate expression of who's in and who's out. And all of this makes me feel a little uneasy. It makes me uneasy when Christians begin judging one another or anyone else, really, about who's in, who's out. It makes me uneasy that rather than placing your trust in God, it becomes about who's holding the right belief about God, who is selling the correct brand of Jesus, the brand that saves. It makes me uneasy when people try to use Jesus' words in an attempt to put the fear of God into someone else. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's the thing. Because of my uneasiness about all of the judging and the way that that verse can be taken coercively to make people afraid, to force them into a position of making a certain statement, all of this stuff around being saved, I don't talk about eternal life that often. And yet, what is to come when we shuffle off this mortal coil is something that everyone wonders about at some point. Now, like me, this may not be central to your life's and your faith's journey, but the mystery of what may lie beyond shouldn't be avoided. So this morning, I'd like to share with you some of the questions that I have. And more than that, far, lots more than me just telling you what, I, what questions are in my mind, I am really curious about things that you think. Because this is a great mystery. So we've got that hashtag if you want to tweet things out to it, or if you just want to write it on your bulletin, share it with me. I would be very curious. I've wondered, will my spirit recognize the people that I have known and loved in this life? Or does the spirit that's encased in this body of clay and dust and dirt, does it just become part of one great spirit where we don't recognize one another? 
In John's story before Jesus' death, he said, don't be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. My father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. So in this, Jesus gives a view of a large house. It's very concrete. Everybody can imagine a large house. Sometimes it's called a mansion. And he, it's a very concrete image, and it relates to the life that we know. A life where we are known. A home where you are called by name and valued. And so... One of the happiest moments in my life, if I were to go to say, if there was a moment that I was felt just almost pure joy, was a camping trip that our family took through Glacier Park when Miles was just a baby. We made him sleep in a box because we were afraid that we would roll over on him. And on that trip, hiking, my spirit felt so content and glad and at ease. And so sometimes when I have one of those concrete images of what I imagine the life to come to be like, I imagine it as a family road trip like that where we get to explore the universe for eternity. There are other times when the idea of spending um, eternity in a minivan with my kids does not sound as tempting. (laughs) And I've wondered about our relationship. So much of my life is defined by roles. I'm a father, a spouse, a pastor. I'm a son. I'm a friend. When I imagine encountering my mother in the life to come, I imagine that she is my mother. She retains that special relationship with me as do my boys, my spouse. Yet even so, I wonder. I wonder how that will really be. I even worry about that sometimes because it's hard for me to imagine myself stripped of those roles. How will we know each other? Now, I will tell you, for for now in this life, I just chalk this up to one of those things that... God has well covered. I'm going to trust that. And it's going to be okay. But I do wonder. One of my greatest mentors used to say, now that, that is a question for paradise. And he would say this when we reached a question that there was no way of knowing the answer to. And so I've always wondered, If by knowing God fully, as the Apostle Paul puts it, will I have access to the knowledge of all things? Because that would be so cool. I wonder about that. What will I know? Oh, and I have wondered, I have imagined, like the way that I imagine God to be, I have wondered for a long time that does God change, does our perception of God change depending on how we imagine God to be? And I go back to a parable of Jesus to make me wonder this. If we imagine that God is gracious and wonderful, wants the best for us, then that's the God we get. And if we imagine that God is a harsh judge just waiting to squash us, then that's the God you get. I've wondered about that. And there is that big question. And the one that we've got to come back to. The one that John raised to as his community was coming apart. What is the role of Jesus and life and death? I'd like you to listen deeply to these words from John. 
Listen beyond the divisions, beyond the anger and the hurt that he was feeling. Just listen deeply. I assure you that I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and outlaws, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life, indeed so that they could live life to the fullest. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. That's because he isn't the shepherd. The sheep aren't really his. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He's only a hired hand, and the sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I give up my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pen. I must lead them, too. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Despite all the ways that we are divided, all of the alienation that we can feel from one another in the human family, Jesus recognizes that there are other pens. Pens with those that you may disagree with, you might dislike. Pens with those who do things differently. But some way, somehow, The good shepherd must, must lead them to. Ultimately, we are one human flock, sustained by bread, united by humanity, loved passionately by the God who creates and redeems us all, in this life and the next. The faith of Jesus is to acknowledge oneness, that there is one Lord, many pens, but one shepherd. So as this church, as we lean in with wonder and ask these questions, let's now stand and pray that we let our loving know no boundaries, no pens, with our hymn, Draw the Circle Wide, which is in our bulletin or on screen. Please rise.
in plenty and in want, all that we have is a gift from God. In faith and gratitude, we return now a portion of what we have so abundantly received as grateful heirs of the promises of, of God. Will the ushers please receive our offering? Hey, it's almost spring. Woohoo! <laughs> and this is the time of year that we ask you to contribute to one great hour of sharing. So we have a brief video that we'd like to show you that kind of introduces what this uh, fund does. Or not. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> If it's possible to have a favorite special offering, this one's mine, because it goes to the heart of what I believe it is to be a Christian. And that is helping our fellow human beings in time of need. Funds from One Great Hour help supply the basics all human beings need to live in dignity. Clean water, food, clothing, shelter, education, medical care, and a way to support our families. This help is freely given to victims of natural disasters as well as refugees of man-made disasters. It can also be used to start development programs that allow others to become self-sustaining. You can read about um, one of the development programs in the insert in your bulletin today. According to the UCC website, 95% of the money that you give to One Great Hour of Sharing goes to these projects. And for those of you who, like me, research charities uh, that we give money to, that is an outstanding number, 95%. So One Great Hour of Sharing provides funds for programs in 138 different countries as well as in the United States. So, there are envelopes in your pews, or you can give online. And starting last week, there are four weeks of wonderful calendars in the crier and in your bulletin. And I think they'll help you think about how blessed you are and what you might be able to give. Thank you. Will you stand as you are able? Will you join me in our prayer of blessing? Gracious God, we dedicate to you not only these gifts, but also ourselves. Accept what we bring for your own good purposes. In Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
The last couple weeks, there has been a lot of disparaging things said about the phrase thoughts and prayers. And if prayer is just words, words that are said politely, it is not, and it's not an honest conversation of your heart with God, an honest expression of the faith that's in you, then it's not prayer. Real prayer is a spiritual connection that moves around us and changes us, calls us to want things to be different, to work for healing. Let that be what we do now. Each week we come in with the prayers of people in this community, and I offer these prayers up to God, and together we say, when I say, Lord, in your mercy, can we offer to God saying, hear our prayer. Janet Weibland's sister, Joyce, her spouse, Claire, died this past week while she was visiting her parents in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so we want to pray for God's love and comfort to be with Joyce, Claire's family, and Janet, and all who grieve today. Lord, in your mercy. Frank Robertson's friend of many years, Richard Wagner, he was involved in a car accident back in December, and if you recall, recall his spouse Shirley was killed in that accident. And for, uh, or excuse me, Richard has had uh, a lot of pressure building up on the fluid around his brain, and on Friday they operated to relieve some of that pressure. Relieve some of that pressure. So we just want to hold, hold him in prayer today and ask for God's presence and healing to be felt in him as, as Frank goes down to visit him, hopefully in the days to come, too. We want to pray for him. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Linda Moses asked for prayers for her sister-in-law, Betty Joyce, whose body is dying with cancer. And as she prepares for the great mystery of eternal life, we ask for God's blessing and presence to be with her with her spouse, Frank, with Linda, and with all who love her. Lord, in your mercy. And despite the initial pain felt after surgery, I have really good news. Rachel Rubner's sur um, surgery to relieve decades of chronic migraine headaches seems to have been successful. I can't even imagine what it'd be like to go through decades of chronic pain like that. So the, the news looks very good on this, and so we just want to celebrate with her this morning. Lord, in your mercy. Is there a person that you've loved whose spirit has gone to the mystery of eternal life? Take a moment now to let your spirit commune with the great spirit, with our God. Let's take a moment of silent prayer together. In our community's continuing prayers, we keep all people who are living and serving in the middle of war in our prayer, and we ask for the Holy Spirit to keep them safe and to help us all find a path to peace. And for caregivers and for those living with dementia, may they receive the respect and the love that they deserve. And we pray for God's guidance for this nation's ideals of freedom and justice for all people in these turbulent times. And we pray for all people who are living in the shadow of depression or mental illness, and we ask for God's light of hope to shine. For those immigrants and refugees who are far from the land they knew, we ask for safety and compassion to come from Christ Church. And for those loved ones in our lives who are with cancer and other ongoing life-threatening conditions, we pray. For Evelyn Johnson, Heather Rubish, Sean Bolter, Betty Joyce, Kayla Ball, Andrew Wood, Kelly Hokinson, Nathan Green, Elena Thorne, Mark Tavault, 
Timothy McDonald and Lee Frommelt. And we ask for God's strength to flow from our prayers to them. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophies. Let's now pray as Jesus did to the Lord of earth and heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before our closing hymn this morning, I would like to invite Marilyn Upman to come so that she may tell us about some of our unsung heroes here at Colonial Church. This morning, we are honoring people who deliver. Now, Stacy Algren delivers babies, and Aaron delivers sermons, but I'm talking about people who deliver items. For instance, when you bring stuff to the little red wagon, uh, you, you, you know it's going. It's going to where it needs to go. But actually, it takes people to do that. And I have a bunch of deliverers this morning. So will you come up? And maybe we'll have to more than one row, but you can figure that out. Uh, Martha Wofford, Bob and Judy Laveau, come on down. <laughs> Lauren Griffiths, Diane Kuhn. Kathy Cook, Marianne Fleming, Art and Marianne Foster, Hen uh, Henry, Hannah, Honey Hannah, boy, that's hard, Honey Hannah, Aaron Roberts, Chucho Marquez, Susie Upman, Bill Yon, come on. Bob Starkey, Martha Wofford, and Jenny Cosgrove is not in the room at the moment, but she's one. Okay. Okay, so now, Miriam? Oh, good. What do these people, Chucho? <laughs> what, what do these people have in common, except they're all good looking? And <laughs> you weren't supposed to laugh. <laughs> and, and they were affiliated with the church. Well, they deliver things. Uh, and Martha, who isn't here, uh, is, I put her up here in, uh, to, to, because she leads the care committee. And the care committee delivers cookies, and they deliver plants, and they deliver good wishes, and they deliver meals. So they're always delivering on our behalf. Now, Bob and Judy Laveau are special deliverers because every Wednesday, not just whenever, every Wednesday of the year, they go down to two Walmart stores, pick up things that are no longer, that you could no longer sell, like there's a poke in the uh, diapers or something. Uh, and they take them to cross lines. And sometimes 
They have so much stuff. They have to make two trips. And then they, they're sorted, and they go to the thrift store, and they go to the Christmas store. And Bob and Judy do this every Wednesday. And then we have the deliverers of the little red wagon. Now, Lauren Griffith, for about a year, every Sunday took the little red wagon stuff and delivered it to the, uh, the uh, yes, the village church food pantry. And now we have Diane Kuhn, who delivers to uh, Shawnee um, Community Center, Kathy Cook, who delivers to Catholic Charities, Miriam Fleming, who is taking Lauren's place, and I deliver to uh, Crossline. And then we have Art and Marianne Foster. They deliver all those little uh, prescription jars to the um, uh, Humane Society. And then Honey Hannah delivers people to the doctor, to the hospital, back home. She has a willing heart and a car. Now then, we have people who deliver people to Molly's stable, people who drive the 15-passenger van to bring Molly's people's table over here. And that includes... Aaron Roberts, and Chucho Marquez, and Susie Upman, and Bill Yan, and Bob Starkey, and Martha sometimes drives her uh, van over. And then I added Jenny Cosgrove, because last summer, Jenny delivered her husband, Jim, Mr. Stinky Feet, to Sheffield Place for a party on Mother's Day for the moms and the kids. So, that's a lot of delivery. Now, I invite you now to stand as you are able for our closing hymn. It is number 608 in our hymnal or on the screens. Christ will come again. <laughs> Let's sing together. Christ will come again. God's justice.
Our souls are eternal, energy that can never be destroyed or lost. The vision of what lies beyond this mortal coil is a mystery, yet we hold God's love, a power of resurrection and renewal that is at the very center of our creation itself. So in that love, we commit our souls and our future. We, I, I don't talk about eternal life too often, I know. Yet the Gospel of John puts it in front of us with hope. I hope that you've had a moment here today to consider that mystery in your hearts. And I hope that will continue in the days to come. We are bound together with God in Christian love now and forever. So now let's turn toward the center aisle and acknowledge that as we make our covenants. And if you're not at a point in your life where you feel like you can make this covenant, that is perfectly fine. Please receive it as a blessing and a prayer that someday you will. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in Christian love. We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and to love our neighbors as ourselves. With God's help, we will honor Colonial Church in our conduct, support its program, and extend the influence of Christ throughout the world. God be with you. God be with you. God be with you till we meet again. Our time of worship is now over, but our service begins now. So go in peace and live passionately and love faithfully and celebrate every moment of life that you have from now until our life's finale. Because you know what I think we're going to find out? Our God of resurrecting grace goes with us forever and always. Amen. Amen.